them. Right. I would like to give you a small insight into modern developments in the context of autonomous weapon systems and or autonomy in weapon systems and uh, military AI. And speaking of AI and safe learning systems, uh, you always have to know that there is much more influence on many areas of society, not just in the civilian area, but also in the military field. And that comes with all kinds of implications and issues regarding the war context, but also control and regulation of such systems. Right. I am a political scientist in peace and conflict research, and I work at PSEC at the Technical University of Darmstadt in Hesse in Germany. And PSEC combines computer science with peace and security research. We have an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary field here, here that is freedom and conflict research, cybersecurity and privacy and human-computer interaction. That's all linked in our research, and we are looking at connections between all these fields. And the question, what are autonomous weapon systems, is something I'd like to look at first, because that gets us to one of the main problems regarding autonomous weapon systems. Because until today, there is no unique and accepted definition of autonomous weapon systems, which is linked to the fact that there are no fully automated systems uh, yet. So that would be a tighter definition. And some states in their military strategy uh, are not that interested in really defining what that term is. And often autonomous weapon systems are equated with unmanned drones, uh, which you can see pictured here on the slide. So these are remote controlled by humans, partly autonomous. But that is by far not the only use case, but that is the kind of image that mostly is connected to that term. And one very well-known definition comes from the International Committee of the Red Cross. So I've copied it here. Any weapon system with autonomy in its critical functions that can select and attack targets without human intervention. So the term is about systems that do not require human intervention <laughs> and can decide which targets they focus and attack these targets by themselves. And often people talk about autonomous weapon systems when they are only partly autonomous. For example, in the context of assisted systems, remote control drones, that ha where some functions are autonomous and some are controlled by humans. And again, it's very important to understand that there is no hard limit between autonomous and uh, partly autonomous. There are various levels of basically the same technology. It's much more about the question to what extent humans are still involved in the decision making. And even if fully autonomous systems uh, in the stricter sense are not deployed yet and not in use, it's very important to talk about regulation options at, uh, right now. Since all the risks and challenges can be anticipated already, so we need some kind of overview what is what we are facing and what developments uh, we have to watch. Right. Now, where do we actually see the use of partly autonomous or autonomous weapon systems? Again, that depends on the definition that you use. And uh, depending on the definition, 
you can observe autonomous or partly autonomous systems used in the military battlefield. For example, there is the Israel system called Harpy, which uh, can uh, circle above an area partly autonomously and then uh, de de defend against uh, enemy attacks. In the context of the Russian attack on, the, on Ukraine, uh, this started with mostly conventional systems. They were dominating at the time, but there is the AI recognition systems for uh, missile attacks. And meanwhile, we have more and more reports about the use of drones. For example, these so-called switchblade drone, which also has autonomous functions. In any case, unmanned drones with partly autonomous functions are definitely part of the military inventory these days, even if today it has to be the human that, that issues the final command, uh, there is a lot in use already. So the question, what is actually so problematic about uh, automatic systems? Uh, from many perspectives, there are problems. Uh, and challenges. They are from the point of view of technology, of international law, security policy, ethics, and humanitarianism. And there's a lot of research still necessary to get various social actors from civil society, um, from national states, the industry, the military, bring them all together and discuss these issues and find solutions. I'll uh, just have to get a sip of water. Now, if you look at the legal and technical issues, then in the context of the Geneva Convention, you have some important questions. So who has the legal responsibility for the handling of autonomous systems? And are the existing laws actually sufficient, or do we need new ones? And also, how can central principles of international law can, uh, how can they be modeled in software, in code? Is that actually possible? And one of the central issues in the legal context is whether autonomous systems will be able to tell civilians from combatants apart in the field. From a technolo technical perspective, how do we deal with the black box problem? More and more autonomy creates more and more risk of unexpected behavior of these systems and technical flaws might exist. So the question is whether and how, from a technological perspective, decisions by an AI can be made more transparent. And the issue is very relevant for partly autonomous systems too, where a human is still involved in the decision making. There we have studies about the so-called automation bias, which show that people will, in the most cases, simply accept suggestions by a partly autonomous system because they can no longer re understand how that decision was made. And that is because that is why even with partly autonomous systems, you can talk about a loss of control by the human. From an ethical point of view, the use of AI weapons leads to a further dehumanization of warfare, where decisions about life and death are delegated to an AI. That, of course, raises, uh, makes people just uh, patterns in data and objects, and that would be a real uh, violation of human rights. So, especially from the ethics perspective, it's very important that there's always a human in the loop. So, because of this, 2013, the NGO Article 36 have developed the concept of meaningful control. So, 
this is a um, very important human control and this concept is very popular and now it's um, applied from many organizations, international organizations and states, but so far it's not really clear what this human control should look like and what exactly how it should be developed, especially in the context of human AI interaction. There's a lot of research necessary. And then there's a further perspective on autonomous we weapon systems. So let's go to the technical and legal aspects in the international debate, which d is not very important at the moment in the international debate or doesn't get a lot of spoken about. And so the question is how problematic is AI and how biased is it? So there's still a common misbelief um, that if artificial AI is more objective than humans and doesn't make any mistakes. And actually it's the opposite. Uh, AI is not neutral and objective because these systems are developed by humans and applied by humans and so they mirror the um, biases and uh, oh. <laughs> so this starts with the training data of algorithms. <laughs> this data is not a collection of objective data or facts and especially in even in civil applications it's very clear because there are so many examples and studies which show that for example face recognition is Worse when there, um, it tries to um, recognize people of color in contrast to um, white people and women are, it has a harder time recognizing women opposed to men and especially difficult, a lot of difficulty recognizing women of color. And the same applies to vocal recognition. And then there's the question, how good are the training data, especially if they are used for such sensitive areas like military. So in the context of war, there's also um, the problem of signifiers. So in the context of war, signifiers are used to give a target profiling and to categorize humans by this um, target profiling because after the Geneva Convention only people should can atta be attacked which are not civil but are involved in the military context. So this categorization is central to who gets attacked and with the drones there are already examples that young men in close to war zones are categorized as involved in the war and this implies that every group of people whose gender is involved in in this profiling they are automatically more at risk in these war situations and also besides gender it's also age and religious um, Actions, for example, praying in groups, are used as indicators um, to for whether people are attacked in those war zones or not. And an autonomous autonomous weapon system would further, um, yeah, in increase those problems and intensify those problems without any questioning. So. I would like to also quickly talk about why the regularization is so complex and complicated. So the autonomy and weapon systems, um, there's a campaign um, to stop killer robots um, and that's like mostly, that's an NGO which is involved for many years. Uh, to talk about and bring into the civic eye how these 
autonomous weapon systems dehumanize people and the problems involved with those systems. And they are already very, um, they were quite successful. There's this expert group which were already involved and they are talking about the regularization of autonomous weapon systems. So far, unfortunately, they couldn't really agree on a lot, these experts, so it's vague uh, rules or guidelines and a huge obstacle for regularization is this common unified def definition because we don't have that one as we stated in the beginning and it has been seen as a necessary basis for such contracts for a long time. And the realization in autonomous weapon system has that it's so difficult has several reasons. So here are three very important ones. So autonomous weapon systems are not a weapon category in itself, so not like nuclear weapons, which we can describe quite precisely and then regulate. So autonomy is a property which can be applied to a lot of different systems. And autonomy can occur in military context, but also in civic context. So it's better to talk about autonomy in weapon systems and not about autonomous weapons because that makes this more clear. And another point is that in the classical application to regularization in weapons context, it's mostly the quantitative regularization, so how many um, weapons should be there. And here we are talking about software, so what's a quantitative regularization of software, so we need a qualitative regularization and rules, which may, might target the application context. And the third point we have here is um, it's so far we're talking about um, something which is not that visible so far, so we cannot really orient it on other processes with, with other weapon systems. So it's more preventative. And these points are only a few points, but those um, lead to a lot of difficulty for finding common grounds for regularization. And so there is a um, group at the United Nations, but yeah, so far, due to these and other courses, they haven't come to a consensus so far. So the only consensus they could find so far was so far that in this context of autonomous weapon systems, there should be uh, some human control. But what this should look like, there's no common ground about this yet. So that's the end of my talk.